good morning once again. Welcome to Grace. Uh, good to have you with us. It's nice to see all the smiling faces out there. Uh, we're studying the book of Romans, Paul's handbook on faith. Today, we're going to talk about conduct becoming believers, and this will bring us to a short study on marriage. Um, a marriage is presented from the pen of the Apostle Paul, and so this is where we'll go this morning. We've come to the end of Romans chapter 8 which completes the second cornerstone of the book of Romans called the cornerstone of sanctification. Uh, we learned about justification in chapters 1 through 5. Then we examined the doctrinal term called sanctification in chapters 6 through 8 where we came across some interesting things about our being set apart in Christ Jesus. Now I want to talk about sanctification today from a couple different vantage points uh, before we move ahead to chapter 9, the dispensational cornerstone. First, we discovered that the term sanctification simply means to be set apart as holy, or we might say to be set apart for a holy purpose. We also found that there are two different types of sanctification mentioned in God's word. The first type of sanctification mentioned is, is uh, uh, the fact that every believer is set apart by God as being holy, as we said, at the point of that person's belief. In this first type of sanctification, God is the one who is performing the setting apart. Uh, we learned that God accomplishes this sanctification by joining all who believe to the person of his son. In other words, a judicial, spiritual union take place. It takes place at the point of a person's belief as you were immersed, not into water, uh, but into the person of the Savior. This is what being baptized into Christ is all about. Uh, it has nothing to do with feelings. It has nothing to do with emotions or behavior. It's simply a fact. Since we are one with Christ, what belongs to Christ belongs to those who are in Christ. Uh, so our position of holiness in Christ is a spiritual accomplishment. And it's a spiritual accomplishment uh, provided by the Holy Spirit for all who take God at his word concerning what his son accomplished when he died for our sins at Calvary. Uh, I think you can see how justification and sanctification go hand in hand. Justification is our gift declaration of righteousness. Uh, sanctification is how that judicial decree of rightness is achieved. Uh, here we uh, have a couple of verses that speak to the issue of sanctification where God is the one responsible for doing that setting apart or that sanctifying. Both of these passages come from the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, the most carnal assembly, by the way, to which Paul wrote. And that tells us that a believer's carnality does not reduce, does not retract, does, uh, meaning it does not diminishing it, diminish in any way the sanctification that God performs for the believer at the point of that person's belief. Notice verse number 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul writes here, Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are, and what does it say here? Sanctified to them who are in Christ Jesus, uh, called saints or holy ones, along with, uh, Paul writes, that's the Greek word meaning together with, along with all that in every place, the verb tense is calling upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Uh, so to be sanctified in Christ Jesus is not something you accomplish for yourself. It's something that God accomplished for you by joining you to his son, as we've been saying. This is the only way, as we mentioned uh, numerous times in this study, that anyone can legitimate, legitimately be called a saint or an holy one. So this first type of sanctification has to do with a gift decree of rightness. A gift decree of rightness that uh, becomes the, uh, the ownership of, of, or the the position of every believer at the person of that per, uh, point of that person's belief rather. This first type of sanctification has to do with the gift decree of holiness. Comes totally apart, totally apart from any action, totally apart from any attitude on the part of the one who's believed Paul's gospel. Uh, you'll probably remember the listing of sins that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 where he told us that those who lack righteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now this passage has perplexed a lot of folks so let's pull it up once again because there's still some who are a bit confused as to what Paul's talking about in this passage. We'll begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? It's a question mark that the translators put there. Be not deceived, don't fool yourselves, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Paul goes on in verse 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, no doubt 
the carnal saints in Corinth there would have found themselves somewhere on this list. We know that some did. Uh, most likely some were guilty of the entire list. Uh, but Paul isn't bringing this list to their attention in order to frighten them with hell. He's bringing these things to their attention in order to remind them of something else. He wants to remind them that God no longer sees them in that light. Uh, he's bringing to their attention the fact that God is now viewing them apart from the righteousness that belongs to his son. Uh, no longer viewing them, I should say, apart from the righteousness that belongs to his son. In verse 11, we find that while the aforementioned things were true of these saints in Corinth, something else was true of these folks that guaranteed them heaven. Here it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. And such were some of you. He's going back to this list. And such were some of you, not you did these things, but you were these things. But ye are washed, because they're now something else. But ye are what? But ye are sanctified or set apart in a judicial sense as being perfectly holy in your union with Jesus Christ. But ye are justified, the recipients of God's gift decree of righteousness. In the name of the Lord Jesus, and notice the one who accomplished this justification and sanctification reality for these carnal believers, this was accomplished by the Spirit of our God, not by those carnal believers. If Paul had ceased writing after going through this list of deplorable practices, then we could safely assume that continuing to do these things after believing the gospel would result in a reversal of the offender's salvation. Or as some teach, perhaps even the loss of a connection with God that must somehow be restored. But that isn't what Paul's saying here at all. Paul's telling these carnal saints at Corinth that the reason these detestable deeds had not and could not result in a loss of their, their salvation or their fellowship with God for that matter is because as carnal as these Corinthians happened to be, they had a holy standing with God through their union with his son. And the gift decree of righteousness belonging to the son had been totally and permanently credited to the account of these carnal believers, to their account in heaven at the point of their belief. Uh, little wonder that right after listing all these deplorable sins, the Apostle Paul follows up immediately in verse 12 with these words. All things are lawful unto me. Isn't that amazing? The law of Moses being nailed to the cross of Christ. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me. They're not good for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any of these things. Now, we are not under the law today. We are under grace, according to Paul. Now, Paul knew that God was not, nor would he ever judge Paul, according to the law of Moses. As simple as that. Nor will he judge any believer. Uh, but don't misunderstand. Being the recipient of a gift decree of the righteousness that comes by faith, the decree of rightness that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, uh, and being set apart by being placed into the person of the Savior makes none of the things on Paul's list right things to do. Uh, where grace age believers are concerned, especially, but they're not right for anyone to do. They're still sins. And they are just as deplorable to God today and wrong for believers as they are wrong for unbelievers. Whether speaking of believers under the law of Moses during time past or believers under grace in this dispensation of grace. Uh, we can thank God for the truth revealed in Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, and the context here is for a righteous standing before God Almighty. For him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. That ungodly person's faith is counted for what? It's counted for righteousness. So while none of the things on Paul's list, either in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 or we might even say Galatians chapter 5 uh, where Paul presents a similar list, none of these things can send a believer to hell. They are definitely all things, they're things that all believers rather should avoid, which brings us to a second type of sanctification in Scripture called self-sanctification. Here's a passage that speaks of self-sanctification. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Let's read it. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us, and it's, it's uh, personal here, cleanse ourselves. Uh, this is uh, active voice. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness or making our positional holiness in Christ, Christ practical from a maturity standpoint. That's what Paul's talking about in the fear of God. 
Why in the fear of God? Because we have a judgment seat of Christ uh, to which we'll all be present. The active voice tells us that this is every believer's responsibility. We're not to cleanse ourselves in order to gain something from God when it comes to our holy standing before him or to maintain something before God or with God, but because we've been freely given something, namely a justified and sanctified position in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. We're to cleanse ourselves not to keep on God's good side, uh, but because God's already cleansed us, judicially speaking, and righteousified us by freely crediting us with the righteousness that belongs to his perfectly righteous son. Nothing could be better news than that. Therefore, nothing can remove us from God's good side, uh, in a manner of speaking, uh, which is what the final verses in Romans chapter 8 is telling us. Uh, what or who shall separate believers from the love of God? The answer is nothing and no one. Uh, best news the world could ever hear. The carnal Corinthians were doing the precise opposite of what the Apostle Paul wanted them to do. Uh, they were guilty of the things Paul's listing for them, but that did not, could not reduce, reverse, or remove from them the sanctified position that already belonged to them in their spiritual union with the risen and glorified Son of God. Uh, how about the conduct of those who have become the recipients of the the marvelous spiritual transaction called justification and sanctification. How about conduct becoming believers? Uh, let's talk more about that. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about conduct becoming believers in this dispensation. Uh, do you remember what Paul said there? It's, it's been some time since we studied the book of Ephesians, so just as a reminder, let's revisit Paul's words as he opens chapter 4 in this marvelous book. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, Paul writes... The prisoner of the Lord beseech you, I plead with you, I'm begging you is the idea there, that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Uh, put simply, Paul's saying your, your calling hasn't changed. It cannot change. So con conduct yourselves in accordance with your calling. That's Paul's point here. Paul's not saying walk worthy in order to gain your calling. Walk worthy in order to keep your calling. That's not his idea at all. But walk worthy of the vocation that belongs to you because God has freely given it to you. That's the idea. How should those who have been justified freely, sanctified or set apart uh, in Christ Jesus, and, and the, how should those folks be conducting themselves? Well, we should conduct ourselves in a manner uh, conducive to the job that God's given us. We, we should conduct ourselves in a manner that goes side by side or goes in hand with what God has already called us to do. That job, by the way, is our ambassadorship. It's our ambassadorship of the message of reconciliation. How am I to conduct myself given my ambassadorship? We might all ask Paul that. How should we conduct ourselves? Ephesians chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 give us the answer. With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, Paul writes, endeavoring, striving to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We're called to peace. This is how believers are to relate to other believers, Paul's telling us here. He went on there, by the way, in chapter 4, to talk about the, the believer's walk with respect to our past life. He, he reminded us that we've already put off the old man and we've put on the new man. That old man, of course, being our former position in the first Adam. We've put that off. When did we put it off? We put it off when we became a part of the new creation. We accepted what uh, the gospel that Paul revealed to us, what Christ accomplished at Calvary. The old man, our former posi position in the first Adam, and everything we were in Adam number one is gone. Again, when did we put off that old man? We put him off the instant we took God at his word, concerning Christ's finished cross work on our behalf, uh, that he died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead, according to scriptures, having completed the justice-resolving work that he came to complete at Calvary where our sins are concerned. Uh, that very instant, we took him at his word, we became a brand new creation through our belief in Christ's faithfulness, according to Paul. And the old man at that point was gone forever. Uh, we're not talking about our sin nature. We're talking about our old position in Adam, number one, which is the old man. Our former position in Adam became a thing of the past in the eyes of God as we became a brand new creation, in his view, joined to the creator himself. So we're no longer in Adam, number one, but located judicially 
I like to say positionally because we're located there in the mind of Almighty God uh, in our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, so don't confuse the old man with the sin nature. This is a common mistake a lot of folks make, but it's important we know the difference because the old man and the sin nature are not one and the same thing. The old man speaks of our former position, as we said, our identity with Adam number one. That identity is no longer true of any believer. So the old man is a thing of the past, having been crucified with Christ. The old man is the new identity belonging to every believer. The sad news is that the new man continues to reside in the old tent where the sin nature is ever present. Uh, the old man has to do with identity, and the sin nature has to do with propensity. Uh, understanding the difference uh, is important because they're two entirely different things. One is identity, one is propensity. Even though every believer has a new identity in Christ Jesus, every believer suffers the same propensity, the battle against the sin nature that the Apostle Paul struggled with himself on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Paul's admonition is to walk worthy of our vocation is in light of our new position. Uh, refuse to give place to Satan, Paul's telling us, when it comes to your behavioral condition. Uh, that's the idea here in these verses. Nothing and no one can take your positional standing in Christ away from you. Uh, the Holy Spirit accomplished that for you, and the Holy Spirit will not remove nor reverse it, uh, as Paul is assuring us of that in this passage. Therefore, Paul's saying, in light of that, make your practical state or bring your practical state into harmony with your positional standing. Now, this is Paul's admonition for every believer in this dispensation of grace. In chapter 5 of Ephesians, Paul talks about the conduct of believers in regard to the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, do you remember what that was all about? Well, we'll remind you here. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed for how long? Ye are sealed until or unto the day of redemption. Since the Holy Spirit indwells every believer, the Holy Spirit can indeed be grieved when the conduct of believers is contrary to their new position in the Savior. Uh, keep in mind, we did not gain our new position in Christ by being good, but rather by believing on him that justifieth the ungodly, as Paul told us earlier in Romans 4, 5. That's a verse we should all have underlined in our Bibles. God counts the faith of the one who agrees with him as to the reality of that person's unworthiness and the fact that he must be justified by God's gift decree, that God counts that person's faith as being that person's righteousness. It's an amazing truth. Uh, that's what we just read in Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, that person's faith is counted for righteousness. Now understand, and we've said this numerous times uh, in this study, since we did not gain our righteous standing with God by being good, we certainly cannot lose our positional righteous standing in Christ by being bad. Paul's saying, why be bad? <laughs> That's what he's saying here. It only stands to reason then we cannot maintain our position in Christ or our fellowship with Christ uh, in, in that sense by, by any means uh, that we might perform in a certain way. We cannot lose um, our position in Christ and our, our conduct doesn't take that away. It sure grieves the Holy Spirit, but it does not take away our position in Christ. Our test score for performance-based righteousness was woefully inadequate, according to Paul. It was woefully inadequate before we even accepted salvation. And the truth be known, it's been woefully inadequate ever since we became the new creation. By the works of the law, what did Paul say? How many shall be justified? No flesh shall be justified, Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. No flesh shall be justified in the sight of God, that is. Now, maybe in the sight of men, but not in the sight of God. Since this is a sanctification or set-apart cornerstone summation here, we could say, let's look once again at that Galatians passage. Here it is, Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of, that means the faith belonging to, Jesus Christ. Notice it doesn't say in here. It says the faith of Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, a different word, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. In other words, his faithfulness, his faith, not by the works of the law. 
For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That surprises a lot of folks who think they are justified by their right doing. God had to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. He placed, as I like to say it, Christ's test score on the paper of all who have taken him at his word concerning their own inadequacy and the adequacy of the perfectly faithful son who died for our sins according to the scriptures, who was buried, and who rose again the third day, having resolved God's justice forevermore where those sins are concerned. And furthermore, as proof that Christ's test score was sufficient uh, and satisfactory to the Father, uh, God places the Holy Spirit inside all of those folks who would rather have Christ's test score imputed to their account than rely upon their own works or righteousness. Uh, you see, if the Holy Spirit could leave a believer today, uh, pick up, pack up, and ship out, we might say, um, due to that believer's performance, there'd be no need for an admonition regarding grieving him, would there? Uh, if things didn't go well, he'd just depart. He'd leave. The good news is that salvation today doesn't work that way. Uh, the very opposite is true. The Apostle Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit uh, is actually God's deposit. He's, in a very real sense, God's down payment would be the proper way to express it for those who belong to him. Uh, when does God deposit the Holy Spirit into a believer? Uh, well, the answer to that is at the initial point of that person's belief. The Holy Spirit is given to the believer to ensure that God has every intention of claiming that which rightfully belongs to him. So he's our seal, he's, our, he's God's deposit that he's going to claim his purchased possession. Paul states that no less than three times. In fact, here it is uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, where speaking of the Holy Spirit, Paul said, who hath also sealed us? At what point? At the point of our belief. And in addition to that, he's given the earnest or deposit of the Spirit in our hearts. So again, a little later on, the same letter, chapter 5, verse 5, Paul writes once again, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing, speaking of eternal life, is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest, that word earnest meaning down payment, the down payment, the deposit of the Holy Spirit. Then a third time for emphasis here, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Paul's gospel, called the gospel of Christ, in whom also, after that ye believed that gospel, ye were sealed with, what does it say here? You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit himself. He doesn't go into you. He's not deposited into you so that he can take a branding iron and, and stamp the side of your heart or something like that. He's, he himself is the seal. He can grieve, but he cannot leave. Paul said in verse 17, which is the earnest, the pre-deposit guarantee. We might say it like that. He is the pre-deposit guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his, meaning God's, glory. You see, the Holy Spirit cannot depart. Uh, this is our security, folks. God places him with each in, within each and every believer for the express purpose of guaranteeing those believers an inheritance in heaven. What wonderful news here. The Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that God's going to keep his promise. Uh, while the Holy Spirit cannot go, he can certainly be grieved, according to Paul. Uh, now, I know that our study of Ephesians took place some time ago, as I said earlier, but since we concluded chapter 8 of, of Romans with Paul's statement that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, won't hurt us to talk about that which uh, many today think can separate us from the love of God, and that's the conduct of the Christian. Uh, let's put the conduct, uh, the concluding verses, rather, of, of Romans 8 on the overhead once again, verses 38 and 39, as we sum up this chapter. Since the, since the sanctification cornerstone of Romans has to do with the union of believers with the Savior, it won't hurt to take some time to talk about the union of believers today in regard to that marvelous and mystical relationship called marriage. Because marriage is given to us as a union relationship. Uh, as we should now all have firmly established in our minds, the sanctification cornerstone of Romans is all about our union with Jesus Christ. Our oneness with Jesus Christ. Well, marriage is the earthly institution that God provided for believers so that those believers might put their union with Christ on display through their earthly marriage relationships. Uh, let's read verses 38 and 39 of Romans chapter 8 once again with not only our union with Christ in mind, 
but also in regard to the union we have with one, the one to whom we're joined in marriage. Here those verses are, Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded, Paul writes, that neither death nor life nor angels. Now think about this in relation to your union partner. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, verse 39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in, we might say, being in oneness with Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, that's, that's an amazing statement. That's love from divine perspective. Being joined to our Savior, to having become one flesh, such that we are now, from God's point of view, the body of Christ, one with his son, members of his body, of Christ's body, of Christ's flesh, and of Christ's bones. Paul states in Ephesians 5.30, we have God's unending love guarantee. How about our oneness in our marriage relationships today? Think about that for a moment. Do our marriages picture our oneness with Christ? Uh, this is as, as good a time as any to go over some of the things we've talked about in the marriage series that we conducted years ago. Uh, we've not yet had the opportunity to record that study, so uh, remains a topic of interest and a much requested series. We'll use this opportunity as a segue here in Romans uh, into the dispensational cornerstone of Romans that begins with chapter 9. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that comes as a result of our being joined, our being one with the person of his son. Uh, we just read that in the book of Romans there. We might say that there is no sundering clause in our union relationship with Christ. There is a no sundering clause. Yet sundering is common when it comes to marriage relationships today. While divorce is never a good thing, uh, we know that it happens. It's sometimes a necessary thing, as was the case with God and the nation Israel in time past. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8 catches a lot of folks by surprise. Notice what happened in God's relationship with his unfaithful nation. In, uh, in this most interesting passage here, Jeremiah 3.8, speaking on behalf of God, Israel's prophet wrote this, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed, adul committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah went, uh, feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Do you mean God actually divorced Israel? Yes, he did. If scripture's to be believed, God most certainly did divorce Israel. Can God sin? That's an interesting question. Uh, you should all, we should all know the answer to that. The answer is, of course, God cannot sin. God had a very valid reason for divorcing Israel. And uh, it's, it's a scriptural reason. Is divorce an unpardonable sin for believers today? The answer is no, uh, albeit religionists try to make it so. But is divorce a painful thing? Well, of course it is. Certainly it is. Uh, there are earthly consequences to every earthly decision that we make. And those painful consequences are often of long duration, especially where children of divorced couples become part of the picture. What part does forgiveness play in broken marriages? And for that matter, what does forgiveness mean? And what does forgiveness not mean? We need to look at those two things. They're, these are important issues, so we'll be talking about these things in our studies ahead in this marriage series. Sometimes people think that forgiveness means a removal or a reversal of earthly consequences. Uh, tell me, did God not only provide, but also slay the sacrifice that he himself brought for Adam and Eve's transgression in the garden? Of course he did. Uh, sure he did. God also clothed both Adam and Eve in the skins of their sacrifice. God's forgiveness was given, their salvation was certain. We know that. But where Adam and Eve were concerned, were they ever again granted permission to enter into the garden? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely not. So God did not remove the earthly consequences of Adam and Eve's transgression. Uh, you see, their, their refused re-entrance to the garden had nothing to do with God's forgiveness for their transgression, nor did it have anything to do with their eternal salvation. It had only to do with allowing them to reap the earthly consequences of their earthly decision. But let's bring it back to marriage for a moment here. We'll talk about more forgiveness. Uh, we'll talk about forgiveness when we get to that part of the series. The most important question is this. Can divorce be avoided and broken marriages repaired? The answer to that is yes. In many situations, if not in most, this is where we want to focus our attention in this study. Every marriage can be improved. Most damaged 
marriage relationships can be repaired. Uh, breaking the marriage bond can oftentimes be prevented. Uh, certainly, the joy of life can be restored in those instances where a marriage has been broken altogether and the bond of matrimony broken off by the two individuals in their minds. What does it take to have a successful marriage relationship in the first place? Paul's going to tell us as he presents a marvelous designer's manual. I like to think of it as the designer's manual on marriage. And here it sits in the book of Ephesians. If your marriage is a happy one, well, good for you. You're doing something right. If your marriage is in trouble, uh, Paul's saying, be encouraged. There's hope, plenty of it from the Apostle Paul, who is in no way opposed to women or marriage, as some would have us believe. If your marriage is broken altogether, such that you are no longer together and the marriage has been dissolved, take heart. Uh, God's not left you. Uh, he will never forsake you. You have not lost your place in heaven nor your position in his son, if you're a believer, and God is not imputing whatever sin you may have committed unto you, if Paul's to be believed, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21, because he has already imputed all of your sins, to whom? To the person of his son at Calvary. You may be suffering the earthly consequences of poor decisions, but your standing with God has not changed and will never change. So believe it or not, even divorced believers stand perfectly righteous in their union with a perfectly righteous son. Divorced believers stand just as complete in Christ as those who've never had a marriage problem in the first place. That's amazing. Uh, are there painful earthly consequences to face when divorce takes place? Absolutely there are. Uh, divorced folks wouldn't deny that. However, Paul wants us to know that repair is possible. Uh, this study will focus on getting it right to begin with and keeping it right along the way. Uh, so as we begin to dig into Paul's workbook for making marriage workable, <laughs> let's read through the text Paul used as an entrance to God's marriage manual. Here it is, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You mean submission goes both ways? Yes, it does. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Uh, we'll get into that a little later, but wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as, or in the same way, that Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Same subject matter, different direction in verse 25. Husbands, now it's your turn, love your wives, even as, or in the same way, that Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, that it should be holy and without blemish. Final portion, beginning with verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Final section, for we are a member of his. We are members of Christ's body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And they, the two of them, shall be one flesh. That's the union relationship. Uh, final two verses. This is a great mystery, a secret God had been keeping. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, Paul's just embarked on a journey through what might be called the land of biblical headship and submission. Uh, some have called it uh, love and respect. Others call it love and reverence. Uh, whatever names you might want to give it, Paul provides the formula for it. And this is where we're going right now with this short marriage series we're going to do. Here are the areas we want to cover as we work our way through God's marriage manual. There's seven categories all together. Category number one will be preliminary marriage principles. So we'll list five of them for you here. We'll look at each one. Category two is the purpose of marriage. Now here we'll be talking about such things as God's pronouncement, what marriage actually is, what it was designed for. Next we'll be looking at the plight of marriage. Now what's happened? What's happened where marriage is concerned and why? Why is it happening today? What is the state of marriage today? Even when it comes to those who profess faith in the finished cross work of Jesus Christ. Um, 
to have resolved God's justice where their sins are concerned. Marriages are still a problem in many areas. Why is the institution of marriage in such trouble? Uh, with category number four, we'll be talking about the husband's role in the marriage relationship. What is the answer where troubled marriages are concerned uh, from man's perspective? What role does the man play? Uh, what position is God given to the man? What does headship mean? We'll be looking at that. Do men and women have a proper understanding of what being the head of the wife, as Paul describes it, is all about? Uh, or have we developed a few misconceptions along the way when it comes to the term headship? And along the same lines, we'll be looking at the wife's role in a marriage relationship as we see there. Uh, two times God made this statement. First in Ephesians 5.22. God states through Paul, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. And then again, in Colossians 3.18, we see the same statement repeated again. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit or appropriate uh, in the Lord. So no, no doubt, God would have wives be in submission to their husbands. Uh, God has said so. But what does that mean? What is submission all about? And equally important, what does that not mean? especially in light of the fact that in the same Ephesians passage, Paul writes in Ephesians 5.21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Uh, might we be a bit off in our definition of submission? This is something we need to look at. Uh, we'll, we will be looking at the definition of submission more closely as we go. Then we'll explore the picture of marriage. Uh, we'll add a couple here. We'll explore the picture of marriage as God paints that picture from Scripture. Uh, using his own marriage or union relationship with mankind down through the course of time. And finally, we'll wrap it up with category number seven, a prescription for broken marriages. I'm as convinced as anything I've ever been convinced about that not only are many marriages in trouble today, which has been the case throughout history, uh, but that the cure lies right here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33, where this passage is properly understood, or when this passage is properly understood, and marriage partners are willing to put themselves uh, into submission one to another. There's so much sitting here, folks, when we realize uh, that Paul has the key here. Uh, there's more sitting here than we realize with a simple surface reading. Uh, I'm also convinced that people want happiness, especially where their marriages are concerned. People want to be happy. You've probably heard the expression, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> well, it's not just mama. Uh, married men and women alike are looking for answers because they both really want a happy and fulfilling relationship or they wouldn't have married in the first place. The search for answers is good because these answers are available and they're available right here in God's word. Those who aren't looking for answers find themselves turning to one of three alternatives. They either continue the relationship as it is and they resign themselves to just be miserable. Uh, certainly not a happy choice. Sometimes they bury themselves in other projects, hobbies, work. Uh, even other people can become a marriage problem, placebo of sorts. Uh, employed to uh, all these avenues, employed to relieve the tension of an unhappy marriage. Whatever it is, choice number one, the complacent choice we'll call it, is like searching for a nursing home. Is it not? <laughs> Uh, at, at best, it can become the best of the worst. And we're not picking on nursing homes here, but many of them do the best they can. Uh, they do the very best job they can do. But I think you can get the picture here. <coughs> Pardon me. Marriage complacency is not a, a very good thing. Complacency is often a first choice, but it's not a best choice when a marriage is broken. We'll remain together and we'll be miserable is the idea behind number one, the complacency choice. Uh, then some move on to choice number two, also not a good choice. Many unhappy participants in marriage become susceptible to what they think might be love in other directions. In other words, they begin to look around uh, consciously or even maybe subconsciously to find someone they think can provide the happiness they're looking for. Complacency is finding uh, or finding a something substitute. Uh, cheating is finding a someone substitute. Uh, cheating is co a common choice today, unfortunately. I'm sure it's, it's always been that way, but cheating's not only a dumb choice, it's a very dangerous choice. Oftentimes, folks will remain in a marriage relationship from a legal standpoint, yet totally disengaged from the marriage from every other standpoint, emotionally, if, if not physically, both. Uh, 
If marriage complacency is not a good choice, be assured that marriage cheating is an even worse choice. Then there's choice number three. And this one takes place in far too many instances today. Many married people see themselves without any hope whatsoever, without any chance of finding that connection, uh, that connection happiness they so desperately need and long for. So they begin to look for a way out of the marriage. We'll call this choice the call it off choice. Uh, they close the door on their marriage altogether, the call it off choice. Uh, separation in this case leads to disintegration. As the whole thing falls apart, the house of cards comes tumbling down, neither person allowing any room for retrieval or repair. Uh, the determination choice is a devastating choice. Sometimes it seems like the only route for a lot of folks. Uh, it may appear to be the best route for some folks, but it's never a happy route when the emotional toll on family, friends, children, and the couple themselves is actually taken into consideration. The sad thing is, you know what happens with all three choices, whether it be the disengagement, deceit, or destruction choice? Anger. Anger and bitterness begin to take root. Anger and bitterness and deeply rooted resentments then grow inside the individual. And they ultimately find their way out and spewed out upon other people. No one is immune to the fallout here when anger is inside. Not only do the marriage partners become emotionally marred themselves, but the children, the grandparents, parents, even friends are affected adversely by a broken marriage relationship. Is there a way out? Is there an answer? The answer is yes, there is. The answer lies right here in Ephesians chapter 5. The text we'll be exploring over the next few weeks. I believe this study is a must for all who are currently married. It's also a must for all who hope or we might say intend to become married one day. In fact, it's a must for all who are acquainted with married people. It's especially a must for our young people who are contemplating marriage. Anyone contemplating marriage. Because as it's been said, God designed marriage so that it can, be, can actually become the hallmark of human happiness. When God's, design, when, when God's designer marriage guide is consulted and actually uh, followed. So let's begin with category num number one, a few basic marriage principles here to get us started. We'll call them marriage preliminaries and we'll do these in point order. Point number one, marriage was instituted by God, therefore marriage is a divine institution. Marriage is a divine institution. What is it? Well, a divine institution is something that God has established in order to carry out his work on the earth and to demonstrate his authority over his creation. That's a divine institution. Scholars have come up with at least six divine earthly institutions. Now, perhaps you can come up with some additional ones, but here they are, six that are most commonly mentioned. Divine institution number one, volition. The very first institution. God instituted volition. In order to put his own rightful authority and recognition of his authority on display, God instituted volition. What is volition? Well, volition is simply choice. In his sovereignty, God designed choice. Now think back, even before the creation of man, to the angelic host. What member of the angelic host, could it be said, fits the biblical description as being the crowning achievement of God's angelic realm? Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, Ezekiel said. Uh, perfect in all his ways until iniquity was found in him, according to Ezekiel 28, verse 15, not on the overhead. Why, that's the description of Lucifer, is it not? Uh, tell me, did God give Lucifer choice? Of course he did. Did God permit Lucifer to exercise his own will? Certainly. Five times Lucifer said, I will. That proves volition. You'll find those five times in Isaiah chapter 14. It was those five I wills that resulted in Lucifer's name being changed to Satan, the traducer, the adversary, the God opposer. So certainly God gave the angelic host volition. And not only Lucifer, but God gave all of his angelic creation volition or choice. Uh, scripture reveals that a third of the angelic realm followed Satan in his rebellion. So the angels had choice, folks. Volition simply means choice, and it's very clear in Scripture that the angels had choice. Uh, where all living beings are concerned, volition was the very first divine institution established by the Most High God. It was a part of God's sovereign plan. So when God created man, when he created Adam and Eve, 
Did he give them choice? Well, we know that he did. He gave them choice with the establishment of a dietary restriction there in the garden. Of these trees you can eat. Of this tree you cannot. It's your choice, Adam. Uh, you must make the decision for yourself. That's volition. God gave Adam the power of choosing or deciding. Adam chose, as we all well know, uh, and he chose incorrectly, but did God cause Adam to eat that apple or whatever fruit it was of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Or did Adam and Eve eat that fruit of their own accord? I think we all know the answer. Um, they did, and that's volition, that's choice. We see voli volition from the very first created beings, the angelic realm, right on through the creation called man. And God instituted volition. Volition was a divine institution. God instituted it uh, from the get-go, we might say. As God's created beings, um, we should choose to believe God. Simple as that. Uh, and those who do are putting God's authority on display by choosing to believe him and act in accordance with how he tells us to act. Not only to God himself... Are we putting that on display? But to those who choose not to accept the authority of God, we're putting, choosing to accept his authority on display. Volition is a divine institution, as we said. In fact, volition is the first divine institution we see in the word of God. Can anyone tell me the second divine institution established in the word of God? It's an open book test here. If you've guessed marriage, you're right. Uh, marriage is also a divinely designed institution, an authority structure requiring choice. In fact, every one of the divine institutions we'll mention here allow for choice. God instituted marriage. Now, we have some choices to make when it comes to our marriages, do we not? Uh, some choices uh, we are called upon to make in the marriage relationship. We have choices to make not only when it comes to the selection of a marriage partner, uh, but we also have choices to make when it comes to how we're to conduct ourselves in our marriage relationships. Can you think of another divine institution? How about very quickly family? Family is a divine institution. Did God institute an authority structure called family? Yes, he did. Listen to Paul in Ephesians 6, 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You mean they have a choice? Yes, they do. Colossians 3, 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. So family is another divine institution that requires choice. If children... I want to conduct themselves in a well-pleasing manner before the Lord, as Colossians 3.20 says, if they want to do the right thing, Ephesians 6.1, what will they do? Well, they'll obey their parents. But it's up to them. It's their choice. Some do, some don't. All comes back to that thing called volition. And then there are a few other divine institutions found in the Word of God. You probably have a few in your own mind by now. How about government? Is government a divine institution? Why, certainly it is. It's an authority structure. And once again, it requires choice. God tells us what to do. But it's our choice whether or not to obey what God would have us do. There's also the church as a functioning assembly, local assemblies. That's divine institution established by God where choice is involved. Uh, there's an authority structure in place according to scripture even within the local assembly. Uh, finally, we could mention employment. All of these, by the way, divine institutions are established by God himself. The next question is why? Uh, what is the purpose of a divine institution? Why did God establish them? Simply this, each divine institution has been established in order to illustrate the channel of God's authority over man. In other words, God is the authority over all things. And in order to illustrate this, he's established these divine institutions so that man can, by his own volition, by his own choice, demonstrate God's authority over him. Now, by being accountable to God in each of God's divine institutions, we are putting God's authority over us on display. God tells us that we are accountable to each, in each of these areas that I've just mentioned. Let's run through just a few here, and I'll show you what I mean in our time remaining. You see, volition, in volition, is wrapped up every one of those divine institutions, or we should say wrapped up in those divine institutions, is volition. Uh, take government, for example. Notice what Paul writes in Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now put simply, God designed there to be structures of headship in place in the world because God is the supreme head of the universe. Uh, we might call these structures of headship levels of governmental authority. Paul's telling us here in Romans 13 that it was God who designed the institution of human government. Uh, God's plan for man called for 
headship authority or orderly leadership. And that's what government's about. Did God know ahead of time that there would be those who would be given control or those who would take control and in turn govern unwisely, even ruthlessly? Well, of course he did. Uh, God knew about Hitler and he knew about Stalin, just as God knew about King Nebuchadnezzar before it was time for Nebuchadnezzar to reign over Babylon. Yet God allowed it to be so because of divine, that divine institution called volition. God knew about the rule of, of uh, Tiberius Caesar. He knew about Pontius Pilate. Uh, he knew about them before they ever drew breath. He knew that Pilate would be made governor over Judea. But tell me, did King Nebuchadnezzar, Pontius Pilate for that matter, not play right into the hand of the supreme ruler of the universe when it came to God accomplishing his purpose through those rulers he knew about uh, long before they ever came into positions of governmental authority? Of course he did. Paul went on to say there in Romans 12 too, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now what in the world is this talking about? It's not talking about obeying Hitler. Uh, the damnation or condemnation, literally there, spoken of in this passage, comes in the form of reaping what we've sown, that principle here. God would never want any believer to operate in opposition to the clear teachings of his word, rightly divided. Uh, we're to be subject to the higher powers only when those higher powers are not asking us to go against the highest power that there is, and that is God himself, the most high God. God is the supreme authority in all matters of life. Uh, so let me give you a couple other examples here when disobedience was actually a good thing rather than a wrong thing. Do you remember the order passed down by the king of Egypt when uh, he passed that decree down to the midwives of Moses' day? Here it is in Exodus 1.15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other, Pua. Verse 16, and he, the king, obviously the power or authority of that day, said to those midwives, when ye do the office of a midwife, he said this to the Hebrew women, Exodus 1, 16, when you do the office of a midwife, uh, and you see them upon the stools, this was the birthing process at that time, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Now tell me, did these Hebrew midwives obey the king of Egypt or did they do as they knew God would have them do? Well, here it is in verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt uh, told them to do, commanded them, but saved the men children alive. Another example in the Bible of disobedience to a higher power took place with Peter and John. You may recall this one. Some of you already know what I have in mind here. The Jewish council was the ruling authority in Paul's day. And you'll recall that the council did not want Peter and John to teach anything in the name of Jesus. Now, Paul wasn't a believer at this point in time, but the council rejected any notion of Christ being Israel's Messiah. Now, watch Peter and John resist the authority structure in place in their day when those in authority went contrary to the express will of God. Here it is in Acts chapter 4, verse 17, where the context is a miracle that took place at that time. An amazing passage here, folks. Acts chapter 4, verse 17. But that it spread no further among the people, the Jewish council made a decree. Let us straightly threaten them. Threaten who? Well, threaten Peter and John. Let us threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Now, who was the ruling power in place at that time? It was the council as far as Israel was concerned. And the council was saying, don't teach in, uh, in the name of this, this one who claims to be the Messiah and threatening Peter and John if they did so. But did Peter and John obey the authority at that time? The answer is no. Why? Because the authority, they were going ahead of the authority. Of, they would have been usurping the authority of God to do so. Acts 4.18, and they called them, the council, and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now here's where a power authority was actually um, telling some people to do some things and where subjection would not have been proper because what they were being told to do was to usurp what God had told them to do or wanted them to do. How did Peter and John respond to that higher authority in their day? Well, here it is in Acts chapter 4 beginning with verse 19. But Peter and John answered. They answered that authority that said, do not do this, uh, do that. And, uh, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, 
judgee. So Peter and John said, who should we obey here? Should we be, obey man, even though you're the authority, the power in place, or should we obey God? And then they went on to say, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So in Acts chapter 5, verse 21, it says that the high priest, along with the council and all the senate of the children of Israel, sent for the apostles. Now, listen to the apostles' response in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So understand that obeying God rather than those in authority might very well lead to unpleasant earthly repercussions. Men have been burned at the stake in time past for that, doing that very thing, but it's still a matter of volition. So volition is in place, is it not? Being subject to the higher powers is God's idea unless those higher powers are asking us to go contrary to what God would have us do as expressed in his word. So we can't think that being, uh, being subject to a higher power, especially in governmental positions, is always the right thing to do. Uh, we have a choice to make, and that may cause for, call for some repercussions when we, when we are disobedient to those higher powers, but we must be obedient not to a constitution. That's not what it's talking about here. We must be obedient to the word of God itself. That's the believer's constitution. According to God's word, if we believe that God is the supreme authority in the universe, that he is the supreme head above all, then we are to place ourselves under the authority of the higher powers in all situations where they are in agreement with the word of God. In situations apart from those where God's word tells us to do otherwise, we're to obey the higher powers. The, eye being, the idea being here that as we obey the laws of the land, we are demonstrating God's authority over us. That's why he put all these volition institutions into place. So that we could demonstrate his authority over us as we demonstrate our volition, our choices in the, the uh, inst divine institutions God established. Because God is the one who told us to obey the higher powers in whatever divine institution those higher powers exist. Uh, we may not all like all the laws of the land. But we can obey or we cannot obey the higher powers because the divine institution called volition is in play. Um, the choice is ours. Same, some are law keepers, some are law breakers, some for very good reasons and some simply out of rebellion to authority. Um, but I think you can see volition sits at the very core of every divine institution that God has established. The same holds true in the divine institution called family. Uh, the same holds true in the divine institution uh, called the church or the local assembly. The same holds true in every divine institution. Is it the role of the husband to boss the wife when it comes to, to her submission? Absolutely not. It's very clear. Scripture is very clear on that. Then what in the world does headship mean? If the hus husband doesn't become the supreme order giver, uh, if he doesn't deal with his uh, wife according to law, then what does headship mean? Well, for that, you're going to have to stay tuned as we continue our study of the designer's guide on marriage, a marriage from the, Paul, the pen of the Apostle Paul. So we'll pick it up in our next session right here where we left off today with some additional preliminary marriage principles that will lead us to the differing roles in the marriage relationship and how your marriage can be a marriage made in heaven. Remember that God gave us marriage for the purpose of demonstrating through our marriage relationships our union with him. And nothing, he allows nothing to come between our union with his son. Nothing at all. So we should allow nothing to cause that sundering, that space that comes between husbands and wives in far too many instances in our day and time. The answer, the key is right here in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll apply this book, we'll apply Paul's words to our marriage situations today and I think you'll see that no matter the situation, no matter how broken, there's repair there uh, for every marriage relationship if we follow Paul.